much ado, I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Professor B.M. Goswami, to deliver his keynote address. Essentially, I have come here to learn. I know remarkably little, but I am eager to learn. But in addition to learning, I am going back from this particular place in this exhibition <clears throat> with gratitude for two things. One, I'm going back with a restored faith in creativity and a restoration of faith in this particular institution. Essentially because I've met with Lily Pandya and not met but we met Dr. Pavan Jain and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. <clears throat> It's not very often that one gets an opportunity <coughs> to speak on a subject on which one knows virtually nothing. But some thoughts come to mind which I'd like to share with you. First of all, <coughs> I was nearly converted to Jainism when I went through that exhibition. <laughs> and then I and the blessing of the Buddha. Um, thank you. When this very kind gift was offered to me, the richness of this exhibition, you know, two phrases come to mind from the world of Urdu poetry. So, <coughs> तो चौदह तबक रोशन हो जाएंगे। चौदह तबक क्या होते हैं? I do not know, but I can understand the extraordinary compliment that is contained in these simple words। अरे साहब इसको देखेंगे तो आंखें खीरा हो जाएंगी। आंखें खीरा हो जाएंगी meaning what? You wouldn't be able to see anything else with the same pair of eyes. <clears throat> this exhibition, and I'll not go on sort of in this train for too long. This exhibition is an eye opener in a manner of speaking. I've been associated with the Calico Museum of Textiles for many, many years, and I know textiles a bit. <clears throat> I also know what happens in the world of creativity in Gujarat. But to bring these things together, textiles and paintings, is an achievement. Let me mention what do we take away from this particular exhibition. I am quite sure if any one of you, in fact most of you have, looked at these objects with any degree of care, and listen to this very, very engaging and learned introduction to the exhibition by Dr. Pavan Jain, you'll not be easily be able to take things out of your mind. What do we take from a work of art? Mir Takvi Mir, the great poet, 18th century, said something very beautiful, beautifully. मुंह ताका करे है जिस किसका हैरती है ये आईना किसका talking about a mirror this mirror is looking at this face now and this face at another moment and asking itself the question who do I belong to the question is easy to answer it belongs to the one who looks into it a work of art belongs to a person who owns it, who really essentially 
takes care that it will form a part of the museum of his or her imagination for a long, long time. For objects to form a part of the museum of your imagination is an essential part of looking. So, the recommendation that Dr. Jain was making when she was taking us through the exhibition that you should come back here again is a very valid recommendation. At this moment, we have just got a very, very fluttering, fleeting, evanescent view of what is on display. But it deserves a second, a third, a fourth visit. Things have to be looked at with care and intensity with the desire at the back of your mind to learn, to absorb, to be reminded of times gone by. What am I going to say in the few minutes that I have? I begin with a degree of regret. Have we lost it? Are we really aware of what we have lost? Just now when we're sitting and waiting for the things to start happening, I was reminded of a great verse by Mirza Ghalib. Sab kaha, kuch lala ho gul mein namaya ho gai. Mere khak mein kya surte hongi ke pinha ho gai. What has been lost? Some, not all things that are, were there have survived. Some of them have survived or appeared from the surface of the soil in the form of a rose and a tulip. But some come. And one can only visualize, imagine, and regretfully go back to the times when these things were around and now lie buried under the sands of time. What do we understand from an image like this? The detail from a page, Indra, the king among gods, or the god among kings, is seated. One of the first things which is noticed about Gujarati or Jain painting was a feature which is extraordinary in abstraction, the, what is called the hanging eye. Is an eye which projects beyond the contour of the face. It's called the further eye sometimes. It is called the hanging eye. It's called the, you know, appendage which is difficult to understand. It's a characteristic feature. It disappears after a few centuries, but it remains there for those few centuries of early Jain Gujarati painting. Why is it there? The eye has a very, very important place in images. I'm sure many of you are aware of the fact <clears throat> that great ceremonies, excuse me, <clears throat> great ceremonies were associated with bringing power into an image. Kumar Swami, 1908, in his medieval singer, his art, has a 10-page chapter on a ceremony called Netra Mangalya. And he talks about, he has visited it, he's seen it, 1908. And he says that when a temple has been created, made, an image has been created, and so on. The last thing to be done for that particular sacred image for the eyes to be put in or as it is called, opened. And the great ceremony, the man who has made the image, the idol, is invited to a tremendous number of people gathering outside and so on and what, wanting to watch what is going to happen. This man, the sculptor, 
is invited by the king, stands in front of the idol that he has created, and with his brush in his hand, he doesn't even look at the image. He looks away from the image. Because he is sure that when the moment eyes are put into that particular idol, it will have a power, it would have an energy, it would have an illumination which he will not even be able to withstand. That is the power of the eye. Netra Mangalya is a ceremony. So what do we talk about when we look at it? that eye which goes beyond the contour of the face? Unless that eye is there, unless it is put in there, unless it is noticed, it does not have the energy that the painter intended to invest the face with. There are other explanations, I am quite sure. One explanation very early on was <coughs> that the palm leaf on which it was being painted or drawn or engraved in fact, that it has a resha, it has a kind of a, a texture that the thing with which you draw, it naturally slips and goes in this particular direction. I don't believe that for a moment. I think it is the importance of the eye, the energizing eye, the power giving eye, the life giving eye that is in the mind of a painter and of the people, the great patrons for whom these paintings were made, at whose behest, behest these paintings were made. In a certain sense, when we write the history of Indian painting today, we tend to dismiss Jain painting in one page or two or three or something like that. Much of the space, much of the time is taken over major schools of painting which came in afterwards, the Mughal, the Rajasani, the Pahadi, the Zekani and so on. And there was a time when a great deal of scholarship was devoted to the study of Jain painting, but that time, sadly, is past. Hardly anything really truly penetrating, touching upon Jain painting, has been written or spoken about in the last 20 years or so. Hardly anything. Why? I don't know. There's a time for recovery. It's a time for forgetting things, it's a time for recovering things. It's a time for recovery to look at Jain painting for the qualities of abstraction, of imagination, of running away from visible reality and diving into yourself to engage with the reality which is inside of you. When I see a great Jain painting, what can I say? Jum bhi shaisi hai mere sine ke karon mein kahi Aur bani jati hai mahaol mein ek aks jameel There are stirrings inside of me Stirrings in the cavernous gloom of my heart so to speak And when I see this or when I feel this and I sense this then bani jati hai mahal mein pause jo it is as as if a rainbow is beginning to form in my mind we i think have neglected jain painting for a very long time and this is a regret i wish to share with you also the satisfaction that the focus is shifting certainly has shifted in this particular place and through this exhibition I think a message will go out to scholars and practitioners. I'm delighted by the fact that among the people who are participating 
are going to participate in the symposium which is going to follow after I have spoken my poor words that there are practitioners, people who are engaged with Ajrak, for instance, who are in a certain sense going beyond the limits of known and so on. Can you imagine this? The patola and so on, so forth, like this. The time it takes, the quality of imagination it needs. Every thread has to be thought about this color, this length, and so on, so forth. One or two families, maybe only one family. Um, in pattern and so on is practicing. Fortunately, fortunately, in this I can say about the arts of India, the crafts of India, nothing has been lost forever. The skills are there. The skills are all there, I mean, for us to recover and to bring them to prominence. Some time ago, there was a great big festival here in, Chan in Delhi where great craftsmen were being um, honored and so on, and I was asked next day to speak on that occasion and so on. And I said, see, this is what it is. Today we are placing them on the stage, honoring them, garlanding them, handing them certificates and so on. Tomorrow, if any of them goes into the corridors of power which are the, belong to the Sarkar, nobody would recognize them. Nobody would offer them a seat outside the office of the officer whom they have come to see or seek some minor concession. We have lost respect. And that is something to be greatly regretted. And it's time to recover it. Next one, please. Let's look at a painting for a short while. Just absorb. Just absorb the extraordinary range of figures. On the one hand, they look all these dancers and so on who are in the Indrasabha, they look they exactly like each other and so on. But, but that is not what we are here to look at only. Next one, please. The richness the enjoyment that the painter must have had, the wallowing in the glory of these particular figures and so on and so forth. We really need to empathize with, take part in. Next one. It's extraordinary calligraphy. We do not have great calligraphy in India. It's not like the great Islamic calligraphy, the Arabic calligraphy and so on, which the Quran was written in generation after generation and so on. Millions of works are produced in that tradition, but we do not have calligraphy as a celebrated art in our own land. But this calligraphy is decorative. This calligraphy is really born of imagination. I mean, the Krishnamatra, I mean, it's so difficult as to absorb the vowel, not follows, but precedes a particular consonant. Next one. So we are, in a certain sense, being bathed, laved in color, line, design, and that we miss. You know, the things are hidden. Some time ago, I was given the charge of holding an exhibition in Frankfurt of the book fair, <coughs> the, 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 the international event and so on. And on the Geetko, and I decided to have something. And people brought all kinds of objects on the Geetko with paintings and textiles and and all kinds of things. And one person brought a mala of like Rudraksh beads. And I said, what is this? How is this relevant to the Gita Govind? He says, have the answer take here. Each bead had been cut, opened, text of the Gita Govind written on it, snapped back like this. And the entire text of the Gita Govind, that great text from the last 
great texts of Sanskrit, so to speak, had been woven into the into this mala, each bead containing one Ashtapadi after another. Extraordinary things. So if we do not pay attention to what has been lost or is in the process of being lost perhaps, we are in grave error, I could tell you that. Next one, please. This tradition, this practice, not tradition, of the further eye, the projecting eye, the other eye, carried on in not only in Jain manuscripts, but in others. Bhargopal Stuti, for instance, and so on like that, and so on. So these figures, which are not a half as decorative, not a fraction as decorative as those in Jain paintings and so on, carry on with that kind of a tradition. So difficult to get rid of an eye which goes beyond. And when that eye disappears, to start missing it. Next one, please. Strange things are happening in these paintings. Krishna holds a flute. Where's the hood? Holds it in the left hand. And it is going through the neck, so to speak. Is he creating a is the painter unaware of the fact that it cannot the, the fruit cannot sort of penetrate the flesh like this? What is it in his mind? I don't know. I do not know. Next one. <clears throat> I'm quite sure Dr. Jain and her colleagues have had access to texts like the Varnaksamuchai. Now we have great many terms which describe specific designs. We have names for them. Now, Varnaksamuchai is a very early text of which a Gujarati version is what I had access to and so on and so forth. Now, I, I share with this with you. I have about 10 minutes left, so don't despair. <coughs> I was in Dallas and there was a gentleman in a small party that we had who was in charge of the Earth Day, which is a great event every year in the United States. Earth Day is being celebrated. And I just happened, but not, I had no plan to ask him a question. I said, how many synonyms for the Earth you have in the English language? And he struggled. Earth, sphere, orb, that's where he got stuck. I said, do you know that in the Sanskrit tradition, in very early texts, there are 42 names of the earth, 42 terms which describe the earth. And that, when it was published, afterwards somebody pointed out nine of them were missing. So there actually should be 51 terms that I should have been citing. The richness of our language, the richness of the terms that we were able to invent is disappearing, is completely going out. And we are relying upon terms imported from here, there and so on, which are non-descriptive, which are just very, very, you know, in a certain sense, arbitrary. But here, let's say, next one, please. Otolo. Patola, of course, the great textile. But the second paragraph, if you look at Patola, only part of the salvia, the one, 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 and so on. The, the tights here, just in the fourth line down. What kind of designs? Chavdi vat, akrot vat, pool vadi vat, pan vat, ratan chow, jevi vat. And navi ras vat, vagahati vat, and so on, so forth. They are there. 
their designs, names for each design. Richness of the language, which in a certain sense was internalized by the craftsmen of that particular time, is what I am mentioning. The Varanak Samutra is not the only text. Next one, please. I mean, if you want to know how many types of food there are or fruits there are, just look at this. Pastab, Nijma, Chai, Ajir, Darbuja, before you start salivating, I finish. Now all this is Nariyal, Khare, Kudrak, Khajur, Anjir, Darbuja, and so How many names do we remember? Exact descriptions <laughs> of fruits, vegetables, eatables. The Varnak Samutra is one of the texts which is rich in this kind of thing. Next one, please. Varnak Ratanaka is another. And I'm sure that it is accessible. I'm sure one can take things from it and get precise words, terms to describe the designs, the patterns. Next one, please. Shalva Kalpa Dhamma, another text. Now, there is a richness of text that we have not drawn upon. I'm not talking about the present exhibition. I'm talking about the world in general. At the same time, next one, please. <coughs> I wish to draw your attention to an extraordinary manuscript which is not entered, not materially entered into our awareness of the expansion of the Jain style. One of the greatest words, works in the Persian language, the Shahnama of Firdausi, which is an extraordinary text. And it is zillions of, of editions, <laughs> not editions, versions of copies of it are produced at one particular time. A Shahnama painted in the Jain style. As I published leaves of it in a small publication from the Museum Reedberg in Zurich, and I've called it the Jainesque Sultanate Shahnama, mid 15th century. What must have happened? The Muslim Nawab of some particular place wanted to have a Shahnama painted. This is my guess. Painters around did not know the Mughal style, the Persian style, and so on. But Jain painters were around. So he said one of to one of them, I can describe to you what happened in the Jain in the, the Shahnama. So you paint them in the style that you know. So this is the Jainesque Sultanate Shahnama that we are looking full of abstraction, full of extraordinary things and so on. It is now dispersed. The Rietberg Museum has only about 17 or 18 leaves, but one is in the Cleveland Museum, another in the Philadelphia Museum and so on and so forth. Now there are, look at the range of costumes in here. This, the abstraction, I mean this, what, this thin stream that is <clears throat> vertically rising from the bottom of the page to the top and so on and so forth is meant to be a river, a great big river. But the, aunt, the painter has compressed it. It is river which is flowing. That's why the fish are there. And the two opposing armies about to arrive at some kind of an agreement are there. Next one. This is what we can do according to the imagination of the giant painter who painted a text that he was not familiar with at all because it belonged to the Persian tradition. What name do we have for what she is wearing? Can we have a name? <clears throat> do we have a name for the pattern or the, the costume as a whole? Next one, please. Or this. Extraordinary in terms of abstraction, extraordinary in terms of the imagination of a painter who's unfamiliar with the text, knows only his own style. He's adjusting his own style to a text that he's completely unaware of. Next, please. The eyes are just about to emerge from the configuration of the face. Next one. 
these certain real things, these patterns, these extraordinary figments of the imagination. Next one. These eyes are very close, very, very close to the eyes of figures in the Jain tradition, main Jain tradition. Next one. When Sohrab is killed, Rustam, his father, not knowing that he has killed his own son, sits down and grieves. In a simple, very, very simple panel, he and his companions have cast off their normal clothing. They are wearing blue-colored libadas. Jama e Neel Guru, which is called, which is a one in which you grieve for losses. Very moving. Next one, please. Now that deal. That demon, the black or the dark-skinned one, in fact, has a hanging eye, if you notice it. That eye is projecting beyond the configuration of the face itself. What am I saying? I'm not lecturing on the Sultan and Shahnama. What I'm saying is that need to expand and include things in our view of Jain painting of that particular time. Next one. This is a wonderful Vigyapti Patra which you saw there. The King Jahangir seated up there. Next one, please. And there's a text here. Radha Sri Ramadas and so who was an interventionist, a kind of a thing, who went up to the emperor and so on and begged on behalf of the of the Jain Munis, the Jain community, in fact, that this, these sacrifices must stop during a particular period of pollution. But interestingly, next one, please. Different costumes. I'm sure many of you are aware of the fact that Hindus and Muslims at the court were asked by the Emperor Akbar to wear the same jama, the jama was common to everyone, the distinguishing marks was that the Muslims would wear the jama tied under the right armpit, Hindus would have it tied under the left armpit. So, so that there is no confusion because people were dressed in the same fashion more or less and social faux pas should not happen. Next one please. But this is the Munijya Jain Sarvakshavaks coming up. Next one, please. But this is interesting. Among the audience, there are some people, and if you notice in Devanagari, these two people are identified only on the basis of what they are wearing. This one is Arabi, the one in front, and the one behind it is Rumi. Rumi means Turkish. So people have a clear idea of what these people wore, what you associate with a particular people from a different land and so on. Arabi, Turkish. Next one. What I'm saying is you can read these things. You read into these particular documents and so on. Next one, please. Vastrapatas. And this kind of a joyousness that you feel. These figures could have come from a manuscript, but these figures are now on textile painted. Next one, please. I mean, if you had a little drum in your own hand, seeing this, you might like to sort of start drumming yourself. That is the kind of joyousness which belongs to these. Next one, please. Next one. I mean, emotions of different kinds, costumes, of course, reflecting those. Next one, please. 
The likes of this you have seen above, and you will hopefully see again. Next one, please. But what I am saying is that these extraordinary Vastar Bhattas have been painted on textiles, of course, as the name indicates, and so on. I think we need to be, in a certain sense, integrated into our minds when we look at this particular world, this rich, colorful, emotional world that Jain painting opens up for us. Next one, please. But you can reduce it to nothing or the very minimum. These are the costumes, if they can be called costumes at all, worn by common people. Dr. Jain pointed out the difference between the haves and the have not. Next one, please. Next one, please. We're back to where we began from. Let's look. Let's look again. Let us be aware of the fact that a world, not of painting but of thought, is waiting to be seen by eager, young, curious eyes. Nothing has been lost, but it's on the point of being lost. And I hope that in the time that we have ahead of us in the symposium, part of which I hope to be able to attend, <clears throat> we'll have riches placed before us by craftsmen, by scholars, by art historians, by connoisseurs. But I will not end before thanking the National Museum, Miss Pandya. I'm reluctant to call her Miss Pandya. Lily is much nicer. <laughs> because it's beautiful and it's an exciting fragrance. Dr. Jan.